Good morning again, and thank you to all of you who are helping to plan and lead worship this morning, including Jennifer Fry and the lovely bell choir. What a delightful <coughs> hymn this morning, anthem this morning. Thank you. And Jamie, Bob, what a gift it is to have you here with us this summer as our organist. And a special thank you to all of our dedicated deacons who do so much week in and week out to make worship possible. And I also want to acknowledge the Taft family who provided the beautiful floral arrangement this morning in honor of their son, Doug. Thank you, Mariner and Janice. Would you please pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we thank you for the gift of your word and for the words that you place on each of our hearts. And oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, amen, amen. I'd like to begin this morning by asking all of you a question, and that is, what comes to mind for you when you think of multitasking? What examples from your life do you have of multitasking? Our family has a neighbor who faithfully walks his dog a few times a day, and he also uses that same time to check his phone. In fact, it often appears to me that even as he's walking his dog, holding on to the leash of the leash of Champ, he is even texting. <laughs> Our neighbor is apparently very coordinated. I still don't know how he does that, holding a leash and texting. <laughs> I have another acquaintance who has not one or two, but three computer screens on her desk in her office at home. And she explained to me that all those screens are absolutely necessary for her telecommuting job today. And I have another question for you. How many of you read the newspaper or a book or do the daily crossword puzzle or play Wordle while you are also eating a meal? I do that sometimes, anyone else? Actually, I do it quite a bit. <laughs> and believe it or not, sometimes I fold the laundry or wash the dishes, and I have even mopped the floor while also talking to my sister Julie on the phone, who lives in Boston. And so I ask you, is multitasking a good thing? or even a necessity today? Or is it something to be avoided? Now, multitasking was certainly a buzzword and became the standard and even an aspiration during the 1990s and into the 2000s. And it was believed then that if we became skilled practitioners of multitasking, then we'd see an increase in productivity and efficiency in the workplace. Well, now, all these years later, recent studies have found that that simply is not true. In fact, some studies have shown that multitasking actually makes us less efficient causing us to make more errors and retain less information. And it has even been found that in some studies, it reduces our intelligence by up to 17%. Can you believe that? 17%. And so now, more recently, we are being advised instead to cultivate the intentional practice of what is now referred to as monotasking. Simply put, monotasking is the practice of dedicating oneself to a given task 
and minimizing potential interruptions until the task is completed. The more recent research from the National Institutes of Health and the American Psychological Association and various university research studies have found that our brains, in fact, are wired for deep and concentrated thinking. And so it turns out that we aren't really created to multitask very well, especially with complex tasks. In fact, even though we believe that we are multitasking, what is actually happening is that our brains stops one job and then switches to another task without our awareness. And all of this stopping and restarting is actually less efficient and less effective. And so, in response to all this more recent research, there is now an increasing interest and an emphasis on monotasking. The research so far has found that monotasking actually has many benefits, including increasing our creativity and focus. It also tends to lengthen our attention spans. It decreases stress. It improves our relationships through our ability to connect with one another more readily and easily. And it also leads to increased feelings of happiness as we learn how to live in the present moment. Now, it may be that monotasking will become the new buzzword, if it hasn't already. And better yet, it is becoming a practice and a discipline for all of us to seek to cultivate. However, while monotasking may be a relatively new term and supported by recent research, there is nothing new at all about the spiritual practice of presence within the major religions and philosophies. In Buddhism, as you may know, mindfulness is the ancient practice of purposely bringing one's attention to the present moment or task. In Islam, meditation is practiced through salah, or prayer, five times a day and through fasting. In Judaism, tefillah, or contemplative prayer, along with meditation, cultivates awareness and resilience. And in our Christian tradition and scriptures, we need only to look at the example of Jesus to understand that practicing presence was a way of life for him, which he modeled for his followers then and for us as his followers today. In the book, An Unhurried Life, Following Jesus' Rhythms of Work and Rest, the author, Alan Fadling, acknowledges that early on in his ministry as a campus minister, given all of his roles and responsibilities and lack of free time and his overall overscheduled life, he discovered that the pace of his work was not healthy for him, nor for his relationships. And it wasn't sustainable. And so in response, Fadling registered for his first spiritual retreat, not as the leader, but as a participant. And that intentional, and prayerful time away from his hurried life changed his priorities and his outlook and his behavior and his life 
profoundly. Throughout his book, Fadling emphasizes that Jesus is our role model when it comes to living what the author describes as an unhurried life. Time and time again in Scripture, we find that Jesus was intentional in finding balance in his earthly ministry by seeking and finding time for rest and renewal. One of the best examples of this, of course, was immediately after Jesus had been baptized by John in the Jordan River and before he began his public ministry, when he set out for the wilderness. And it is clear that it was absolutely necessary for him at that time to retreat for 40 days and 40 nights in order to find inspiration and refreshment for his spirit. And it was also during that time alone with God in the desert that Jesus prayed and prayed and prayed and was painfully honest before God. And then, and only then, was Jesus fully prepared to embark on his Galilean ministry. We also read that early on in his ministry that the crowds would seek Jesus out as the news spread that about his ability to heal people. And again, According to the Gospel writer of Luke in chapter 5, Jesus would retreat to what was referred to as lonely places to pray and to find strength and grace and renewal for his spirit. Our text today is challenging. And the message is hard to even understand and accept. It begins with Jesus addressing the failure of society as a whole by comparing the adults to the children of the land. And in Jesus' words, whose song is never understood. In our gospel reading today, Jesus calls out the fickleness and the faithlessness of the people who continue to fail to understand the message of salvation and restoration and hope that first had been preached by John the Baptist and now by Jesus. However, however, just a few verses later, there is this shift in the tone and tenor of the message toward the end of this passage, when Jesus then extends a gracious invitation to the people then and to the people today to find rest and reassurance and refreshment and restoration through relationship with Jesus the Christ. In the midst of all of our busyness and distractions and being pulled in multiple directions all at once, Jesus' invitation was and continues to be clear. And so the invitation for all of us today is to commit and recommit to become increasingly aware of God's active and felt presence in our lives and in every moment of our every day. And so, in closing, I share these words of Scripture with you that I read earlier. May we all attune our hearts and spirits and become more present that we would be able to recognize Jesus' invitation once again 
when he says, come, come. All you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, come, come. I will give you rest, come. I am gentle and humble in heart, come. You will find rest for your souls, come. My yoke is easy, come, come. My burden is light, come. Thanks be to God. Amen.